Welcome to Tax Break, a podcast on the tax law brought to you by Miller & Chevalier. I'm Steve Dixon, a tax litigator with Miller & Chevalier. I'm joined by my colleague, international tax and tax policy expert, Lauren Pons. Hey, Lauren. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? All right. So it's just the two of us today. Um, so those are always the, our, our most succinct pods. So <laughs> hopefully we can deliver on that today you as well. So today we're going to discuss uh, an action that was filed in the U.S. District Court for the District of Colorado by Liberty Global back in November of last year. And Lauren, I think it's fair to say that uh, we all saw this coming. Uh, we knew that taxpayers would do precisely what Liberty Global did here, which is to challenge the validity of the temporary regulations under Section 245A. As you know, those regulations were meant to close the so-called guilty donut hole. Mm -hmm. And there was widespread knowledge about the planning opportunity that that presented. Uh, and we also knew in this sort of uniquely in this circumstance, we knew that more than one taxpayer took the position on the, their financial statements that those temporary regulations were invalid, which means that they actually convinced their auditors that it was more likely than not that the regulations were invalid. No, no small feat. No small feat at all. <laughs> did. So, so a challenge to these regulations was absolutely inevitable. And uh, we want to talk about, so Liberty Global is the first challenge to get filed on this. And we want, want to talk about a couple of the more prominent elements of that challenge today. The idea behind Tax Break is to provide listeners with some perspective on select tax issues that we think are interesting. And that's usually we, Lauren, you and I, just think are interesting. Just the two of us. That's right. That's right. Committee Hopefully of two. Hopefully others concur, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we want to go deeper than what's in the tax press, but stay sufficiently high level so our listeners can follow along without a copy of the regs or, in this case, the preamble to the temp regs and Liberty Global's complaint in front of them. As always, first a disclaimer, tax break is not intended to be legal advice and you cannot rely on it as legal advice. Its content reflects only the thoughts and opinions of its hosts or guests. So Lauren, let's start out with a little sort of technical background on 245A and the, the guilty donut hole. Um, can you explain, and this is right in your wheelhouse, it is. It is. <laughs> seeing as how you were there when 245A was brought into existence. So can you explain what the 245A deduction does? I will. I, I was there when 245CAPA came. CAPA, yes. Uh, Sorry, yes. As, as tax lawyers, we should be very precise that they're right are not parentheses around it either. There are no parentheses around it. It comes after 245, but before 246 in the code. Um, so 245 Cap A, we should probably explain it in its proper context. So it, during uh, tax reform or as a result of TCJA, we shifted from a worldwide system to a territorial regime. And as part of the transition, there was imposed a transition tax on all previously untaxed earnings and profits that were overseas. So that was section 965. And in the shift to territorial, there was a recognition that there still needed to be some anti-base erosion measures in place. Uh, so the subpart F regime was left untouched for the most part. And section 951 cap A, uh, commonly referred to as the guilty regime was also enacted such that uh, we could kind of book in two types of income that um, CFCs might generate that we still wanted to be able to tax immediately. And that would be passive earnings under the subpart F regime and under guilty active earnings attributable to intangibles. Um, and so all three of those things are taken into taken together kind of in a TCJA framework. And then everything that's left, Guilty allows a 10% um, routine return calculated by uh, reference to the basis of your tangible depreciable assets. So 10% of that value is um, deemed to be a routine return, therefore tax-free in the U.S. And that tax-free mechanism is effectuated by Section 245 Cap A. So a, Dividends received deduction of 100 percent 
for the foreign source portion of dividends received from specified 10% uh, owned foreign corporations. So that's what 245 Cap A does. But once you understand that there are these other regimes in place, you realize that it's really meant to apply to what the regulations refer to, and we'll get into this later, as the residual earnings. So after you apply the transition tax, after subpart F analysis is undertaken, and after guilty analysis is undertaken, anything that's not taxed under all three of those provisions will be subject to 245 cap A. And, and when you say subject to 245 cap A, that means eligible for Right, eligible to, eligible for instead of subject to. Subject to sounds more punitive than, than beneficial. Um, eligible for the the one hundred percent DRD for foreign source portion of the dividend. So, Lauren, what then happens for taxpayer? What might happen at least for taxpayers with a year end that's that's November thirtieth during this sort of guilty donut hole period? So if you have a an 1130 year and you end up with under the statutes and the effective dates in each of the provisions, you end up with roughly 11 months where you are eligible for a 245 cap A DRD, but also not subject to guilty. So if you can manage to um, engage in transactions where you can generate some income, um, that's also not subject to subpart F and for which you, you, you don't have to worry about 965 because it's after um, the end, the measurement date, your last measurement date for section 965. Um, you could be in a position where you have, you were able to pay up a dividend and not be subject to U.S. tax. I've reached your five cap A. And so what did, what did uh, Treasury and the IRS do in the temporary regs to address this? So the service uh, and the Treasury Department came along with uh, temporary 245 cap A regs last two summers ago, June of 2019. Um, and they dealt with two specific sets of circumstances where one might be able to take advantage of 245 cap A and avoid subpart F and guilty. And remember, all three of these provisions are meant to be read in tandem, particularly in the way that the Treasury described it in the preamble to the uh, But they are. We'll, we'll, I mean, we'll, read, we'll read from the preamble in, in that regard, but yeah, go ahead. It is a system. It is a system. But um, so they wrote regs for what they call extraordinary um, dis dispositions and extraordinary reductions. In terms of the guilty donut hole and the mismatch with effective dates, the um, extraordinary disposition rules are what are relevant, and they're also what are um, relevant for purposes of, of Liberty Global. Um, and so there, there are several factors that need to be um, met. It has to be specified property within this disqualified period. So the period for the 1130 taxpayer would be 1-1-2018 through 1130-2018. And there has to be a disposition that's outside the normal course of business. Um, and so that's a facts and circumstances test. And so if that if all three of these factors are met, 50% of your 245 cap A eligible dividend received deduction amount is disqualified as if it were guilty. So um, it's not the full brunt of subpart F, but they're going to treat it as a guilty inclusion and you only get a 50%. Um, deduction, much as you would under Section 250 for a guilty inclusion. So it's effectively, the regs come in and and deal with this effective date issue by mm -hmm. by treating at least some transactions as presumptively subject to a limitation on the DRD. Right, right. And these transactions are um, you also get the benefit of a step up in basis, which would in turn benefit the taxpayer when they were subject to guilty because that's the the calculation basis for um, the 10 percent routine return exempted uh, amount so multiple things going on with these transactions if they were to uh, not have written these regs there would have been several effects not only an, an immediate um, 100% DRD for the dividend, but also future impact in terms of ongoing guilty calculations using basis. this stepped up basis. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk just for a second about Liberty Global because it 
fell into this great 11 month guilty donut hole, right? So yes. um, uh, the complaint says that it's one of the world's largest telecommunications businesses and provides broadband cable and communication services to millions of customers. And there are two relevant entities um, in the complaint, Liberty Global, the parent and a UK company, as well as Liberty Global Inc. or LGI as the complaint refers to it, which is a US co. And what happened was in December of um, 2018, LGI sold its interest in a, in a Belgian telecom something called TJ, TGGH to its parent, Liberty Global, the UK company. And this resulted in taxable income to LGI in the US. Pursuant to the statute, LGI took a 245A deduction and the IRS disallowed the deduction based on these temp regs. So LGI is now challenging these temp regs in, in the district court. Um, and and I think we, we, what we were going to focus on today are, are sort of two elements to to that challenge. Um, and the first is is Chevron. <laughs> and so obviously in in enacting a regulation, uh, uh, the you know the regulation itself has to be consistent with the statute. And that's and that's what. Uh, that's what Chevron stands for, right? The, right? the Chevron step one analysis asks, well, are these regulate, do these, does the statute uh, address um, this issue? Is the statute's meaning clear, right? Is often right. how it's right. expressed. Mm -hmm. um, and here uh, we have an issue because there is an argument that the effective dates in the statute are clear. Clear. <laughs> there is. <laughs> I think that would be a strong argument. I mean, there, the dates are the dates. They're right there. That is true. That's right. That's right. And and what we have here that's kind of unique is and uh, and and certainly Liberty Global readily points this out, but we should we should focus on it is some language in the preamble to the temporary regs that. Um, effectively acknowledges that as applied literally, um, Liberty Global's entitled to a 245A deduction under the statute, right? So uh, I'm just gonna read a couple of sentences from, uh, from, from the preamble to the regs. Uh, Treasury and, and the IRS wrote, however, in certain atypical circumstances, a literal application of section 245A, read in, and then they put in parentheses, read in isolation, in which, isolation. We'll, which we'll come back to here, right. could result in the section 245A deduction applying to earnings and profits of a CFC attributable to the types of income addressed by the subpart F or guilty regimes. The specific types of earnings that Congress described as presenting base erosion concerns. So, uh, I mean, this is a pretty, it's as clear an admission that there is a, an issue with the literal language of the statute as one is going to find <laughs> in a regulatory preamble. Is that fair? I think it's, it's, it is fair if you read the language in isolation, <laughs> that sentence right. is written as in isolation. So, um, yes. It is it is a fair statement, but I do think the preamble, I think the preamble actually does a very good job of describing why 245 Cafe should not be read in isolation. Um, and so, it's it's yeah, a tough, well, it's a tough stance to have to take because you're still left with what the statute says, um, and then you you can look at and we'll get into this a little bit later 7805A. And then you have to go back and argue that, yes, we're talking about 245 cap A, but we should also be taking 951 and 951 cap A into context when we're reading 245 cap A, which is tough. Right. And that was, a, so that was a lot of numbers. And I just want to call out one of the numbers <laughs> there, which is 7805A, yeah. which is a statute that enables treasury, that gives treasury a, a relatively broad uh, 
discretion in enacting regulations to interpret provisions in the code. And, and that's something that, as a historical matter, Treasury has often gestured at in, in often in the, in the context of defending itself from challenges either under Chevron or under other APA circumstances where Treasury can say, well, actually, no, we have rather broad authority to enact regulations and the, the bar for validity is higher. And this is part of part and parcel of what has been historically considered to be sort of Treasury's um, tax exceptionalism. Yes, we've has discussed it. that before on this podcast. Yes. Our faithful listeners will, will know that, but if you are new to- uh, All three, all three of them. Yes, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I want to, I want to pick up on the thread that you were laying out, which is, yes, these effective dates are literally what they say they are. However, this is part of a complex of rules that's meant to operate in a particular way. And, and Treasury um, doesn't, you know, really mince any words about that and says things like uh, uh, the temporary regulations under 245A, the regulations that they're enacting here, are designed to ensure that the 245A deduction operates properly within the context of a closely coordinated set of rules and as a result is not available to eliminate the taxation of sub F and tested income in some limited circumstances, meaning the circumstances where they, where they observe that a literal application could result in a, in a 245A deduction. So that's, right, right. So, so it's clear that what they're doing here is building the case that, well, you can't read these effective dates in a vacuum. Right. I mean, there would not have been the enactment of of the guilty regime if 245 cafe were meant to exempt that type of income right one might one might conclude that that was the case if we're if we're looking at anti-base erosion measures and subpart f and guilty are the regimes that are in place that are meant to put guardrails around territoriality which is what 245 cafe is participation exemption system, um, then, you know, why? <laughs> it would frustrate the purpose of the enactment of the guilty regime to allow for a 245 CAFE deduction to apply to income of a type to which guilty would normally apply. Right. It's and, just that there's a glitch. <laughs> a glitch in the yeah. System. <laughs> there's a there's a glitch and and it goes on i mean the treasury goes on after making this sort of uh, this wonderful alliteration of saying that the deduction mm -hmm. operates within the context of a closely coordinated set of rules um they go on to say this is true even if taxpayers choose to gener generate such income to avail themselves of the benefits of the deduction. So they're saying this is this is true even if you even if you taxpayers rely on these effective dates to try to repatriate right or mm -hmm. or create U.S. income that is offset entirely by the 100% deduction under 245A. Right. Right. And and they actually hear in this regard, and this is sort of a unique element of, of these, of this preamble, they say the treasury department and the IRS are aware that some taxpayers are undertaking transactions with a view to eliminating current or future. And that's an, a nod to your basis point of all foreign earnings of a CFC, including earnings attributable to base erosion type income by structuring into these situations. So we don't know whether the transaction that uh, LGI did with its parent, Liberty Global, we don't know whether that was um, within the ordinary course of business and we can't really sort of weigh in on that. But Treasury and the IRS in enacting these temp regs was aware that taxpayers were at least contemplating this. Right, right. And they do give an out for, uh, you know, the third prong of the test is it did not occur. The transaction did not occur in the, in the ordinary course of business. So 
to the extent taxpayers are able to prove, given their facts and circumstances, circumstances that this was an ordinary course dis disposition, the 50% disallowance of the 100% dividend received deduction is not going to come into play. Right. Um, so if you had a, a recurring transaction, something that happened every year, right. or if you had something where you have documentary evidence showing that it was something you had planned to do long before Congress contemplated moving to a territorial right. system, then, you know, you probably make a case that these regs don't apply to you. Right. 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 I, w I would imagine that would be the case. Um. But they are, but there is, a, and I just want to point out one sort of one more element here in this in the Chevron um, department here, because they they acknowledge that they are sort of making a choice here, and and or and also right part of this is setting up the notion that there is a choice that they have a choice to either uh, be um, vigilant and observe <laughs> the effective dates as stated in the statute or opt to meet the purpose of this sort of closely coordinated set of rules. And they say, in these cases where the literal effect of 245A would reverse the intended effect of the sub F and guilty regimes, this conflict is best resolved and the structure of the statutory scheme is best preserved by limiting section 245A's effect. So basically, we, we have the choice to either apply these effective dates blindly, mm -hmm. as they're stated, or we can do it with our eyes wide open about what Congress actually meant to accomplish here. Yeah, and I think that this is the tougher sell, right? So we get through their explanation of why these provisions should be read in concert, we understand the order in which 245 Cap A should apply. That is last um, after we've we've looked at 965 um, subpart F and guilty. But then they come in and they say, well, we we doing all this. We recognize that there's still a problem with the effective dates as they are in the statute, and we're going to employ a little bit of self help here and write rules to reflect congressional intent. I think that is that's the heavier lift because it's a tough it's a tough road to hoe for yeah, Treasury here. It is, and it, you know the easier case would be two two forty five cap A would have uh, two forty five cap A H. I think the last section now is G. Um, that would say you know anti abuse regulations are permitted, <laughs> and there are other TCJA uh, provisions that do have do grant regulatory authority to combat abusive um, transactions or scenarios. 245 Cap A is not one of them. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's tough because I think the facts as they lay them out in terms of some taxpayers planning into um, transactions to take advantage of, of um, this disqualified period. And that is, that is true. They, that is an abuse. What they have identified as an abusive, um, potentially abusive transaction that they would like to circumvent by writing rules. It's just a tough situation to be in because the statute doesn't give anti-abuse authority. Right, and and it's a tough situation to be in as well in the context of a Chevron argument because you're sort of arguing that there is. I mean, you have to argue that the statute is not clear. Right. You have to sort of. <laughs> well, they're, you, they're I mean, saying it's not clear, <laughs> not clear, not with respect to effective dates, but it's unclear with respect to how those effective dates should operate when you are a special case taxpayer with a non-calendar year in. Right. Right. I mean, <laughs> effectively, they're arguing, well, these date provisions are in direct tension with the purpose of the statute. Um, as embodied in its express language, and that tension creates a kind of ambiguity, even if right. even if the dates in and of themselves are not ambiguous. Right. And so this is a question for you, Steve. We have the congressional record, which which clearly states Congress's intent with regard to how 245 Cafe is going to operate in tandem with subpart F and guilty. 
right? I don't disagree at all with the way Treasury has laid out that they need to be read in tandem and, and their ordering rules and 245 cap A is really a residual earnings provision. Um, but what do you do if you're a rule writer, <laughs> if you're the, the agency interpreting the statute with clear intent, unclear language with respect to the operation of this statute with others, right? That are not, obviously they're not in the statute, they're in a different code section. What do you do? Yeah, I, um, you know, I think that the, the treasury was clearly stuck between a rock and a hard place here. And I, I think, you know, I think we have to give them some credit mm -hmm. in the preamble in sort of acknowledging the issue here and doing the best they could with their, uh, with, with what they have. But that said, I mean, there are, we're, what we're talking about here are the limits of agency action. And, you know, one of the premises in Chevron is that if that there is a there is a way in which to sort of read agencies as being empowered, right? And this mm -hmm. goes into sort of some of the some of the other deference doctrines and our and things that the government has historically benefited from in enacting regulations. And and w w one principle that has been sort of assigned is the principle that Congress uh, in, intends sort of not just the statute, but also the omissions in the statute, right? So if, if, <laughs> right. if the statute doesn't expressly address something, then it has left a space for agencies to fill with regulations. And agencies have benefited from this and rightly so, right, have benefited from this in cases about deference and and agency rulemaking over the years. Here it, you know, they, they, they might be stuck to a certain extent biting the bullet because uh, this is an instance where statute's pretty clear. And if you assign Congress that kind of um, uh, expansive worldview, right? The Congress, Congress is so wise and so all know. It's like the market, right? The market mm -hmm. operates with sort of total information, and you have to assume that the market is always right. Well, you know, there is a sense under sort of agency and APA and deference law that Congress is given a similar kind of omnipotence, right? <laughs> that, or at least omniscience, that it knows what it's doing and it also knows what it's not doing. And that, and knowing what it's not doing is a kind of express uh, assignment to agencies to fill gaps and mm -hmm. to write rules. Um, but here, right, that argument works against you because <laughs> you can say, well, if Congress meant these kinds of temp regs to be enacted, they would have added 245 a h like you mentioned <laughs> or they would have or they would have made some exception to the effective date rule and i think all of those things are going to be very tricky for the government to sort of steer through in in fighting this case right um because if if congress did if if the answer and and you you know i imagine sort of the the government lawyer who has to argue this on summary judgment in in the district court in Colorado, uh, you know, the the hard question they have to answer is: Did Congress make a mistake, right, with their effective date provisions? And and then if if the lawyer answers no, that's hard to make you the rest of your case. But if the lawyer answers yes, you're also in this situation where, um, well, then isn't it Congress's mistake to fix? Like how? Well, how yes, right? yes is the harder answer. You would say no and say, we're just amplifying what's in the statute. There's no That's mistake. right. But That's if you right. say yes, then you're overstepping the bounds of your authority because you're making law, not yeah. amplifying the law. Yeah. 
So it's a it's a it's a minefield. What? <laughs> uh, how how do I fix it? Well, let me let me tell you one thing that I would do, and this is the segue into the next topic. Is if okay. I were Treasury, I would either uh, either do a better job of arguing for an exemption from the notice and comment procedures under the APA, or I would issue these as proposed regs um, more quickly and then move them to final regs rather than using temporary regs. That would right. have been <laughs> because... Was, but they ran out of time. Yeah. They ran out of time. And, and obviously they were sort of time pressured um, and obviously, the wheels of the wheels of regulatory enactment move move slowly. Um, yes. But uh, but you know the the this is another grounds on which Liberty Global is challenging these temp regs, which is that that uh, the IRS and Treasury said we can issue these as temp regs. We don't need to issue them as proposed. And as you know. Proposed regulations are, are available for notice and comment. Temporary regulations become effective <laughs> when they when they immediately or as of their effective date, which in this case was was retroactive. Yes, yes. and um, Treasury said, "Well, we don't ha we didn't have to issue these in proposed form, and we didn't have to issue these subject to notice and comment, or." Actually, we sort of did issue these subject to notice and comment, but it's just like we'll take that into consideration when we decide how to make these final. Um, but these aren't really proposed regs; right, they're effective now because the because once the once the donut hole period closes, it closes. <laughs> right. We, <laughs> we we have to make them retroactive because look, we're we're three quarters of the way through the disqualified period already. Or two thirds of the way through. These were issued in June. Um, so yes. So yeah. So so Liberty Global says you you needed to actually you follow the notice and and comment right. You had to meet meet the notice and requ comment requirement here with these regs, and you did not do so. Right. And because to your first point, their good cause exception explanation was wanting. One <laughs> wanting is definitely the, the 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 word that that comes to mind now. But first, let's say so. Let's be. Gen I'm going to be generous here because mm -hmm. you know me. I'm nothing if not a, a giver. They um, call you Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> Once my beard grows in. <laughs> um, they uh, Treasury did uh, give the old college try here in writing up. <laughs> It's its case for the the good cause exemption, and that has not always been the case, right? Treasury has bit, come under a great deal of criticism in the last you know ten or fifteen years for not complying with APA requirements. And here, Treasury did uh, write a rather long statement of why it thinks that the good cause exception applies here and why they didn't have to follow notice and comment procedures. Right. Um, and they they actually enumerate sort of four different reasons because they actually count them off and say f f we have four reasons. Um, three of them are problematic. Um, and <laughs> well, do or, you need and, all four, or can only one be? Only one. You know, okay. they only need one good reason. One good reason for good. Cause. Yeah, and I think that the, you know, and I think the first one that they give um, is the one that. I think will get the most purchase with a court, but it's also the one that sort of deserves a fair amount of scrutiny here. So, okay. um, so what they say is, uh, and I'm just going to read one sentence from the preamble here. Good cause exists again. So again, we've got to make a case for good cause because if we don't have good cause, then we have failed with these temp regs and they we have failed the APA requirements thus there are validity problems mm -hmm. and validity problems are a big problem here because as we talked about the periods closed um, they say first good cause exists with respect to these temporary regulations because any period for notice and comment as well as a delayed effective date would provide taxpayers with the opportunity to engage in the transactions to which these rules relate with confidence that they, namely the transactions, mm 
achieve the intended tax avoidance results absent the applicability of the regulations. So let's kind of look, unpack that for just a second. What they're saying is that if we, uh, it, we, we can issue these as temp regs effective the day that they come out, because if we don't, if these were just out there in the ether as proposed regulations, taxpayers could just do transactions, these sort of disfavored transactions under the reg. They could do these with absolute confidence that they are um, that they they are getting away <laughs> with tax avoidance here, um, and that is a. a it seems to me like sort of facially incorrect, <laughs> right? I mean, why is that, Steve? <laughs> it will be, well, so how do taxpayers decide whether or not to do transactions? Well, they look at the sort of available guidance and what's out there in you know what Treasury has said and what the IRS has said and what Congress has said in deciding whether or not to do them. Mm -hmm. And this seems to me like it has it precisely backwards. It's, it says, well, if we had issued these in proposed form, taxpayers would know that they could get away with these transactions, even though the proposed regs would say you can't do these. Right. Apparently, it they think that taxpayers would just blow that off and say, oh, well, I don't care that you've got a bunch of proposed regs out there. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And maybe you'll change your mind. Right. Or maybe you won't, but I'm not required to follow proposed regulations. So I'm just going to go ahead and do my thing. But couldn't they have issued proposed regs and then said when these are final, they will be retroactive to uh, what date did they choose? 1 1 2018. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's an option, right? Like they could have done yeah. that. And just you're then. It would have delayed, you know, all of the audits and all of that, but um, it would have had the same effect, essentially. Yeah, and it would have had, I mean, the, the idea that the, the taxpayers are just going to go around doing this with confidence seems to me like exactly the inverse of how these things would operate. Because if you issued proposed regs and said, these are all the really good reasons we have to think that this is the way Congress meant the statute to work, Assuming that you had any faith in those in those reasons, which Treasury clearly does, wrote mm -hmm. them up here as well, um, then shouldn't that have a chilling effect on taxpayers doing these transactions rather than a sort of uh, an, the effect of encouraging, <laughs> encouraging them? Effect. Yeah. Um, I mean, and they, they, you know, they go on and say this is it said. These temporary re regulations um, could embolden some taxpayers to engage in aggressive tax planning to take advantage of the unintended interactions among the act's provisions with the comfort that their actions were not subject to the rules of the temp regs during the period of notice and comment and before the regulations uh, effective date. Again, like that just seems to me like, no, if you issued proposed regulations, they would have had a chilling effect on these transactions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this sort of weird element of, and 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 I think this is a problem for APA purposes. Um, they so effectively what they're arguing is what what Treasury is arguing in invoking the good cause exemption here. Exception is. It says taxpayers have considered, we're aware that taxpayers have considered engaging in these transactions described in these temporary regulations, but some may, been, may have been deterred from doing so because of uncertainty about the operation and interaction of the various provisions of the act. So what this, why this argument is strange is that it's kind of like they're arguing that the absence of guidance here did more to deter taxpayers from doing these tra these transactions um, than uh, than actually having proposed regs out there saying what Treasury's position was. 
Um, and that seems to me to be problematic, not just because um, it doesn't seem quite quite right to me, but it also seems problematic because the APA, the entire idea of notice and comment require of the notice and comment requirement is that the regulations are vetted in the public public sphere and the idea that well we were justified in not using notice and comment because this makes it more likely that people will not do these transactions if they don't know what we actually think uh, that seems to me to violate the spirit of of notice and comment notice in and a pretty comment. fundamental yeah. way. Yes, I would not say that that was their strongest justification for the good cause exception. And they make, they do make a, you know, Treasury also makes an appeal to sort of the principles of, um, uh, of the good cause exception and says, uh, you know, we can in invoke it where, uh, where the timing and disclosure requirements of the usual procedures would defeat the purpose of the proposal, including if announcement of a proposed rule would enable or increase the sort of financial manipulation the rule sought to prevent. And again, this is still all built into this notion that, well, if, if, we, if we announced these in proposed form, a bunch of taxpayers would have done these transactions. So we are better off leaving taxpayers in the dark. That's not a particularly persuasive <laughs> rationale. We're, we're better leaving them off into, in the dark until we announce that these rules are immediately effective. Effective. Yeah, um, yeah I think that that's a, it's a harder, it's a hard argument to make, particularly when in the, um, transition tax deem repatriation 965 provision, there are hard cutoffs for measurement dates of E&P based on the date of introduction of, of the bill. And so kind of to get at that, you know, we don't want anybody trying to manipulate their E&P amounts and thereby reduce the amount of tax they might have to pay once we unveil the plan for how uh, Congress intends to tax tax, untaxed earnings and profits overseas. Right. So um, there are ways to kind of put it in the statute, I would argue, that could kind of circumvent um, some of the abuse that they were afraid was going to happen or thought was happening or had heard <laughs> was going on. Um, and then we're back to where we started, which is if there's a problem with the statute, is that your problem to fix? Right. One other sort of interesting element as these challenges, as this challenge goes forward, and we'll we'll talk about this. I think we'll do a future pod on the the FedEx case, which is a, a, a similar challenge to TCJA regs, um, yeah. although it doesn't have this sort of temp reg element to it. Um, but one of the interesting questions of of in this case will be the extent to which the limited window of applicability influences how the court handles this. I mean, right. Treasury Treasury's not going to be able to go in and say, taxpayers can keep doing these transactions and this is a huge loss to the FISC because it's done, it's closed, it's over. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of, it lowers the stakes <laughs> in a way that um, is interesting and 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 you know leaves courts with a kind of maybe a little more sort of uh, theoretical flexibility as to how to, how to decide this. Well, yeah, but you don't know which way it will go. That's right. right? Like, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The the affected class of taxpayers is relatively small. Does yes. that weigh in you know in favor of? striking down the regulations or does it weigh in favor of letting them stand because not that many people are harmed um, right. there was, there right. was or do you, or is this a place to is this the hill to die on in terms of protecting some principles of the apa because we'll say no you absolutely can't just go and use temp regs this <laughs> is a great place for us to slap you on the wrist treasury for yeah. invoking this exception um, because there's no lasting effect right. to us doing so it's right. just limited to this donut it, period. It's symbolic. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Great. Well, we will. Uh, I, I we hope to follow this case 
<laughs> as it moves forward and we expect others uh, to similarly challenging these regs. So, um, and we will turn, uh, and I hope in a future episode, we're going to talk about some of the other challenges to TCJA regs in particular, the, the challenges to the uh, tax credit regs under, uh, in the FedEx case. Oh, yes. Yes, there's more to come. So stay tuned, dear listeners. <laughs> That's right. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or want to suggest topics for future episodes, you can email us at podcasts at milchev.com. That's podcasts, plural, at M-I-L-C-H-E-V.com. Thanks, yeah. Lauren. Thank you, Steve. Mm-hmm.